Well, I'm delighted to welcome uh, James Suckling today to uh, to UK Cigar Scene for our interview. Um, James, write, James writes on uh, wine and cigars and was for many years uh, Cigar Aficionado's man in Havana. Now he's uh, struck out on his own and we're going to talk about some of his, uh, his new projects. So James, welcome to London. Oh, great to be back. <laughs> great. So I'm interested to, to understand how you got into writing about wine and then in, in cigars in the, in the first place. What started you off on that? Uh, well, writing about wine, I started in 1981 with the uh, Wine Spectator. I was a daily journalist before, and uh, it was in the early days of the Wine Spectator when it, it was in Southern California. Uh, my father was a wine collector in Los Angeles, so I had a passing interest in wine, and I joined the Wine Spectator. I honestly thought I would just spend a couple years doing that and go back to being a daily journalist. But uh, in the end, you know, I caught the wine bug and really enjoyed uh, tasting and traveling the world. And you know, it's 33 years later. So. <laughs> and then from what took you from wine into, into cigars? So cigars, interestingly, uh, when I was in university, I started smoking a pipe uh, because I thought if I smoked a pipe, then I would get uh, better grades at graduate school at University of Wisconsin-Madison because my advisor smoked a pipe. Okay. So I started smoking a pipe and it was fun. I even I remember coming to London in, and buying pipes and in the 80s and uh, in, in 1980 to be exact. Uh, but then someone turn, turned me on to a uh, Cuban cigar and I realized, well, a cigar is great. You don't have to be playing around all the time, lighting it all the time. So I started smoking cigars. So then uh, smoking cigars regularly. And then I found out that the publisher of Wine Spectator, Marvin Schenken, also smoked cigars. Right. So we had this common interest. And then uh, I met Simon Chase when I was living in London. And uh, we were talking about cigars, and I was invited to a uh, tasting in Nick Freeman's office. I think it was around, let's see, I moved here in 88. So it was around 90, and uh, we tasted, years ago, they used to be super generous with old cigars, and Hunters and Franco, we it wasn't even Hunters and Franco then. Uh, uh, we tasted this amazing, uh, a Lonsdale, Monte Cristo current production and one that was 10 years old and one that was 20 years old. And it just struck me, wow, this is just like wine. You can taste a cigar, you can see how it becomes more refined and elegant with age, just like wine improves, particularly red wine with age where the tannins and, and youth of a, of a wine sort of melt into being a beautiful, old and uh, refined uh, beverage. Interesting. And how, how do you compare, or can you compare tasting cigars and wine? No, in, in terms of the way you Absolutely. taste? Absolutely. In fact, I originally came up with a 100 point system uh, for cigars. Uh, I worked on it with uh, Marvin when we were uh, starting Cigar Aficionado. And uh, I basically took the system that I used for rating wine and uh, adapted it for uh, rating cigars. Got it. And I'm, I'm fascinated at the moment by understanding how you can educate your palate to, to taste cigars. Do, do you think it's possible to, to educate yourself in terms of tasting? How, how, how would you sort of, how would you go about it from, from, from an expert standpoint? The, really the way to uh, educate yourself is to smoke with someone that uh, has the knowledge as far as uh, tobacco and what certain things that you taste mean. For example, uh, very spicy uh, ammonia um, harshness in a cigar suggests that uh, the tobacco hasn't been aged or cured properly. Okay. Uh, cigars that have lots of clean flavors, none of the ammonia, uh, but they can still be a little bit rough, suggests that a cigar would be better with age. And then also, once you've tasted a young cigar, then you've had a cigar five years old, eight years old, 10 years old. I was really lucky 
to move to London. Well, actually, I was living in Paris. I moved to Paris in 1985. I was coming to London uh, regularly. Then I moved here in uh, 1988 and lived here for 10 years. But at the time, cigars, it was just a, I wouldn't say common, but it was a, a thing that a lot of people enjoyed. Generally speaking, most people I knew were a lot older than I was. And, and they would normally smoke their cigars after five to seven years of age. Right. So they would buy their cigars and they would age them at Dunhill when Dunhill was on German Street or Davidoff or what was the guy in, um, in a Burlington Arcade? Um, oh, well, Foxes. Fox, yeah. Right, yeah, Foxes. Foxes. Up there, yeah, at the top, that's right. Yep. Yeah, yeah. And, and, so, and then I would go to Foxes and hang with the owner who was a real pain, but he was incredibly knowledgeable, Desmond, and all these amazing old codgers in the cigar right. business, and like <laughs> some young Yank was sort of hanging out and smoking with them, and but they were still really friendly, and oh no, taste this, try that. Cigars weren't expensive. I remember when I first came to London, Desmond, there was a sign in his store on Piccadilly, and it says, uh, old cigars, one pound each. The old cigars were, were, were cheaper than the young cigars. <laughs> Right. <laughs> so yeah. I was just, you know, buying them up, trying this, trying that. Right. So I really had this uh, amazing experience to taste old cigars and, and equate the idea of a young cigar uh, w and then seeing how it aged. And that was important. Then, of course, once we started Cigar Aficionado, uh, then I was traveling the world and learning about how tobacco was grown, cured, aged. And, and later produced in factories. So I learned from all the great uh, blenders and tobacco growers as well. Got it. And you, you've been traveling to Cuba for, for quite a while. How many, mm. how many times do you think you've visited Cuba now? God, I lost count. It must be at more than 50 times. Wow, fantastic. And then 2011, you created the, the heart and soul uh, of Cuba cigars with, with James Orr. Yes. And I have to say, I keep going back to that documentary. It is the most wonderful film. You must have had a whale of a time producing it. It was incredible. And uh, there was lots of sort of serendipity with the movie too. Do you remember the scene where, where, where um, you know, uh, where we leave Havana and we, and we go to, uh, to the Pinar little Rio farm. And there's this farm that we visit. Yeah. That was totally by luck. We're really? driving down the road and I go, stop, look at that farm. This yeah. is amazing. And we just walked out. And I was talking to the guy uh, in Spanish, my bad Spanish. Of course, we had some, we had a Cuban film team. Right. And he was just so friendly. He said, oh, come on, let me show you our tobacco barn. And we're talking, we met his mom. She's his pretty, mom's And amazing. that was all just totally <laughs> by chance. Great. And it was just the perfect story. It really yeah. had the feel of, I mean, it was the real deal. Yeah, and that's, that's right. And it, 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 um, it just injects that, that personality. And the, the uh, I mean, he was, you could see, you know, you never see a fat Cuban tobacco farmer. You could see no. he was a hardworking guy, but right. his mother and the kids, you know, it's just lovely. And it's real life, you know, real life. I mean, it's, it was a real, the movie was much more than just a, let's say, primer on cigar mm -hmm. production. It was really a story about a uh, national product that uh, a country takes great pride in. And it was a story about the people. No, it's a beautiful film. Well, and if anybody you. hasn't seen it, they really should. Uh, Go well, it streams, it. and great. it also streams for free on my site, too. Okay, oh, there we are. Well, we, there you are, and with perfect introduction, yeah. so that was my next question. So you've now, you're, you're up on your own, and you've created jamessuckling.com. Tell me, tell me about that and what you're doing, what you're doing well, there. Well, jamessuckling.com essentially uh, has what I uh, used to do at the Wine Spectator as well as Cigar Aficionado. Um, I worked 30, just about 30 years with the Wine Spectator. And uh, it has uh, all my tasting notes. For example, this year I already tasted 7,000 wines. Wow. And those are all rated. Uh, wines primarily from Italy, Bordeaux, Australia, New Zealand, Napa Valley, Chile, Argentina, Spain, Champagne, uh, and Alsace now. So uh, it's, it's the same thing. I'm a wine critic and people uh, like, uh, some people like, some people dislike uh, my uh, opinions about wine and, and my reviews and scores about wine. Then there's some cigar information as well. Um, I'm really ramping that up now. And a lot of that also is available on my new site, uh, HavanaInsider.com. And that's, yeah, I've just found that. I've yeah. just started looking at that. So that's, and that's a, Havana Insider is a, 
a pure cigar project, but also it, it seems to, to gather together all of your all of your knowledge and information. And it's not just about cigars; it's about Havana too. Isn't exactly. It? Havana, so Cuba. the idea with Havana Insider is uh, it's a source for anyone traveling to uh, Havana, more so Americans, I, because of obviously the change on December 15. Uh, Obama, President Obama's uh, a change in policy with Cuba. I thought it was time to do a website on Havana and really have more of an American uh, view on where to go, what to see, what to smoke, what to eat, what to drink. And I have a um, full-time staff member uh, in Havana. Okay. And then I have another uh, Spanish guy that grew up in Cuba. He's actually the son of the ex-president of uh, Habanos. Okay. Jaime Garcia Andrade. Right. And so Jacopo goes regularly to Havana. So I have some good insiders there. You got the there. inside track. Yeah, on the, on the ground and, and writing cool stuff. And then there's uh, my cigar reviews as well. And I tend to focus on cigars that are available in the Cuban market. Right. Because now uh, Americans who travel to Cuba, you're allowed to bring back $100 worth of uh, cigars. And I've right. done it myself. It's, it's really sort of crazy yeah. to be in Miami and you just get on a plane and you're there in like 32 minutes once in the air and then you know you're in Havana yeah. and like you arrive and they're like and people are saying it's so crazy you arrive and there's a special terminal for American flights and as soon as you get there they look at your passport welcome to Cuba in English yeah and I'm just looking like behind me like <laughs> what after all those years sort of looking at my American passport sort of mm, I wonder what's going on here now welcome to Cuba you get out of the um, immigration looking for your bag may I help you welcome to Cuba Interesting. wow Interesting. that's so a big change yeah and what what you, have you been you've been how many times have you been to Cuba you've been to Cuba since things opened up yeah I've been there uh, in the last year three times or right. in the last uh, ten months uh, uh, three times okay and what, what changes have you seen in that, in that time as a result of the... Well, obviously, the I th people have always been very positive. Uh, well, most people have been very friendly to Americans. And um, I would say they're even more positive now. Right. Uh, I haven't seen... Well, there's a lot of new bars and restaurants opening, and, uh, which is exciting. But I think there's just a general positive vibe to, uh, in Havana right now and to the whole... Uh, situation with the U.S. and for me, you know, a few weeks ago or a month ago, when uh, Kerry, John Kerry, was uh, at the uh, at the US, former U.S. intersection, and now it's the embassy. The embassy. Yeah. Um, I had lunch with the uh, the ambassador as well. Just uh, uh, just three of us with my associate publisher, who's a former uh, diplomat with the U.S. State Department. Right. And wow, it's just it's just you know. I'm just pinching myself. Yeah, I can imagine. I can imagine. And do you think, I mean, th th it always seemed to be the situation when I've been to, to, to Havana that there's the, there is a, a sort of a, a class of people who make money from the tourist industry who, to all intents and purposes, you could be in Miami. You look at what they're, the clothes they're wearing and the way they, they behave. And in some instances, the cars they drive and you think, no, th this wasn't possible. No, this was two or three years ago in Havana. Do you think that the money then that comes in, that the extra money that's coming in from the uh, from the American tourists visiting, is actually going to trickle down to the to the people? That, I think uh, it already has. Uh, obviously, free enterprise is growing in uh, in Havana and Cuba at large. Uh, there's more people opening up uh, restaurants. There's people offering taxi services in old cars. Right. I mean, it's just the beginning, but free enterprise is on the rise and the Cuban government um, is supporting that. So I think it's all positive. And what do you think that the, when, when everything eventually opens up and the, uh, there is free uh, trade between the US and Cuba, what do you think that's gonna do to the, the, the generally to the Cuban cigar market worldwide? Well, uh, you know, obviously we've all talked about this for years and we've all thought about it. And I think that uh, you know, the scenarios are still the same, that um, there'll, be, there'll be pressure on uh, Cuban cigars, <coughs> more Cuban cigars, to find their way into the U.S. market. I still believe that the U.S. market is the, uh, is the biggest consumer of Cuban cigars in the world. I think a lot today. of- Today. Yeah, today. Right. That a lot of cigars from the U.K., France, Hong Kong, all over the world, make their way to the U.S. At one time, 
I thought that as much as one third to half of all Cuban cigars go to the U.S. Okay. So I think there'll be even more pressure for the cigars to make their way to the U.S. Right. I don't know how Habanos or Altadis um, are going to uh, manage that because also there's a lot of issues with trademarks and other things. But right. I think in the end, uh, the market's going to be there. Obviously, prices will go up because right. uh, production is down. Uh -huh. So, I, anyways, I think it's positive, but there, it's going to be tough for a few years when production and distribution has to adjust to an open U.S. market. Interesting. Yeah, and uh, when everybody's wondering what's going to happen with that, and the, the the point is, I think whatever happens, it's coming, isn't it? It's definitely. It has coming. to come. It's, like, it's, too, it's gone too far now. Mm. That's what also I think is exciting. The fact that the U.S. has its embassy, uh, Cuba has its embassy in the U.S. It's a done deal now. Uh, you know, we got married again. Right. So. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Okay, so you, for, for your travels to Cuba and, and you're enjoying the, the new Partagas Madeira mm. now, what, 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 are you, what are you smoking now that you're, you're really enjoying? Uh, well, I, what's interesting to me too is that I, I have quite a few old cigars, but I really, I don't know what it is, maybe when you get, get older you like younger things. <laughs> so uh, it, it's interesting that I tend to smoke a lot of new production cigars. Right. And aside from the few um, cigars that don't draw properly, I think that's still a problem. I really enjoy the Hoyo um, Epicure Number no. 2 right now. Mm. I think it's smoking great. I've had a few uh, good Partagas. Uh, uh, series D number fours. I tend to be still a rob robusto smoker. Right. I really like that size. Um, of course, my favorite cigar has always been the Siglo Six. And right. you know, I was—I I can't remember. I think it was in 2006. I was made Habanos Man of the Year. Right. And once you've been given that award, they give you a, a free box of cigars for the rest of your life. Okay. Which is nice. And I chose the uh, Siglo Six. All right. That's interesting. I, I, I've always said. I, I remember sit, smoke, sitting smoking with, funny enough, with uh, Edward and with uh, Simon Chase mm -hmm. at, uh, at um, just up the road at Franco's. Uh, I walked along and they were smoking uh, cigars, and they sat, I sat down and smoked a Siglo Four with the, which Simon pulled out. And I always said, if I could only smoke one more cigar for the rest of my life, I'd, uh, a Siglo Four would be my uh, my cigar. Oh, so how funny you say that because I had a Siglo Four the other day, and it's a cigar that I hadn't smoked for a long time, and I thought it was really excellent. That's, and that, see, that's really interesting. We send out blind tasting cigars, and I sent out uh, some pyramids, and someone came back and said, that was a great cigar, marked it up. Um, and I said, right, well, that was a Partagas P2. And he said, yeah, it's amazing. That's just a cigar I'd forgotten. There's this huge rush towards what's new. What, I've got to smoke the, 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 the new, new thing. What, what's, but then you forget all these wonderful classic cigars that are just sitting there. And that's just the major brand, brands, brands. If you I, uh, look I think at the what's, other what's smaller interesting, ones. If you look back when, when I started smoking cigars in, in England, Cuban cigars, that at the time, most smokers smoked the same cigar. Mm. And you were either a Monte Cristo Lonsdale guy, you were a Torpedo guy or a Churchill guy. And now people really like to try different cigars try different sizes, yeah. and I think that that's really uh, fun about cigars. And I think that Habanos has done a good job in uh, diversi diversifying lines and making different cigars every year, and it's really part of the fun of cigars. Yeah, yeah, but you always have to remember the old classics, because mm. they're still there and they're still wonderful. And the beauty of it is, while everybody goes out and smokes something new and exciting, those older cigars are sitting on the shelves aging. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> but again, you have to be careful of of, uh, of production dates, because mm. of course we had a fairly bad period from about uh, 1998 to about 2002, yeah. where a lot of the cigars, there was overproduction and they didn't draw very well, and also yeah. I don't think the blends were very good. Yeah. But from about two, 2003 to now, there's been a, uh, a, an improvement in, in, in production in quality. Go now. Excellent. Well, James, that's been fantastic. We're going to finish with the uh, with our three standard questions. So, uh, number one, what as, uh, I'm fascinated by this. So, what is your uh, what's your favourite uh, tip? Or what do you like to drink with a cigar? Just about everything. <laughs> but uh, it's true. Like this summer, when I was at home in Italy, you know, uh, I'd have a cigar, and there would normally be some nice wine left over. But I guess. Uh, 
uh, it would be vintage port. I like uh, drinking with, uh, with uh, cigars because uh, I like the fact that I think when you're, when you're smoking a cigar, you don't want anything that's just pure alcohol because I like to say that it's just like putting a uh, lighter fluid on a, on a barbecue. You know, your palate's hot, you're smoking something that, ha you know, that's burning. Right. And if you just have something that's really alcoholic, then it just, it burns your palate. So I think something with a little bit of sweetness, yep. like Cuban rum has a nice sweetness to it, uh, some cognacs, uh, some single malts, and then of course uh, vintage port uh, obviously is sweet and uh, beautiful to smoke with a cigar. Perfect. Sweetness is really interesting actually. Yeah. I'm coming round to that more and more, that has that, 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 some sweetness. I was drinking some uh, a cigar with a, a, a white wine last night with a hint of sweetness in it and yeah. uh, it really worked very well. But so, obviously uh, cold beer in the fields in Pinar del Rio, smoking a cigar and you're you know, so humid and hot really hits the spot. <laughs> Okay, and what's your favorite place? Where do you like, uh, where, what's your favorite place to smoke a cigar? Well, obviously Havana. Okay. That's, for me, one of my great pleasures in life is uh, when I'm in Havana, is go to Plaza Vieja. And there's this, I can't remember the name of the coffee shop, it's where, have you been to I it? I have, Esco yeah. Cafe Escoria. Yeah, Escoria. Right. And I like that sitting there in the morning, having a, uh, a uh, cortado, you know, a, a short coffee with uh, with milk, sitting out there and smoking the first cigar right. uh, in the morning. And watching the, watching the Cubans all yeah. dashing off to work through the square. Yeah, wonderful. And finally, um, one cigar that you remember above all others, your most memorable cigar. It's funny when being here in London and uh, thinking about that, it has to be an old cigar. And I remember, uh, it must have been about 20 years ago, that uh, they came across this cache of Cuban cigars from the late 1800s that had been uh, found in a Scottish castle. And these cigars were auctioned, but they actually uh, gave, gave me one of the cigars. And it was a, a Perfecto, so tapered at both right. ends. And it was a um, very, very dark cigar. It was obviously sun-grown tobacco. And so uh, I lit up the cigar and uh, I was also at a dinner with Simon Chase. I think we were actually even in Orlando for uh, one of the cigar conventions. And I brought that with me. And there was Edward, Desmond was there. I think Marvin Shankin was there. And we lit up the cigar and it was amazing. It was still perfect, sweet, beautiful flavors. And then we passed it around. Uh -huh. I mean, really probably good. people thought we were smoking something else, <laughs> but it was actually an old ancient cigar. And I'll never One forget off. that. It was just amazing quality still. Fantastic. And I love it That's when to smoke something like that and you just think of history. Yeah. It's what so was evocative. When, that, when yeah. that cigar was being rolled. So that was one of the great sort of smoking moments. But there's been yeah. so many because, you know, smoking cigars, it's not just about actually the cigar. It's about the company, too. Yeah. yeah. James, that's wonderful. That's really been fantastic. I've thoroughly enjoyed it. Oh, my and pleasure. And I'm uh, d delighted to, uh, to have had you here in London. No, and I uh, wish you safe, uh, safe onward travels wherever you're heading from here. Great, Nick. Thanks again. Look forward to seeing you in Havana. Excellent. Thanks, James.